My name is Warren McAdams. I'm a doctor of physical therapy, board certified as a clinical specialist in pediatrics. This video will cover the second edition of the Bruinings Osoretsky Test of Motor Proficiency, also known as the BOT-2. Uh, I will discuss what this outcome measure entails, indications for its use, and when to use the complete form versus the short form versus just one motor composite, whether that's the fine or the gross motor composite. Um, but given the complexity and the depth required for scoring, converting, and interpreting, I will cover that information in a separate video, and I'll post it in the description below. Um, for now, what is the BOT2 and who do I use it on? Uh, so as its name would suggest, it ultimately assesses motor proficiency. Uh, following the assessment, the data conversion and interpretation, uh, the assessment will yield a percentile rank, age equivalence, and varying descriptive categories. And at first glance, that may not mean much because many other outcome measures do the same, like the PDMS-2, for example. Uh, but this measure encompasses a wide range as you can use it for children as young as four years of age to young adults all the way up until their 22nd birthday. So uh, a huge, huge population in the setting of pediatrics. <laughs> um, so if you learn perhaps two or three outcome measures and as you're just starting, this is one I would highly recommend because it covers such a gambit. Uh, but what's more impressive than just its age span is that this norm referenced standardized outcome measure doesn't just assess an individual in comparison to others of similar age, but it also has norm references that are sex specific or you can combine them. So for example, um, you can get referencing on male or female uh, if your patient is male or female, or you can just use the, the combination. Um, beyond that, some research shows that the BOT2 even has discriminative validity for conditions like developmental coordination disorder, which DCD, um, autism, and intellectual disability. And, and what I mean by that is that this outcome measure can differentiate typically developing individuals from those with DCD, autism, or intellectual disability. So that can be pretty influential as an aspect of a screening tool that you use. Um, so at this point, you might be wondering, okay, so it assesses motor proficiency, but uh, what domains? And, and for that, I would like to reference two sources just to keep things all within a glance. The first one is actually the record form for which it shows the tests right here and the subtests line by line. Uh, but if you are someone that prefers a pictorial representation, then within the BOT2 manual, and I am using just um, scans rather than the actual resources for propriety rights. Um, this video is just for learning purposes only. Um, but here is the uh, pictorial representation, and this is figure 1.1 on page 4 of the manual. And you'll be able to see that the total motor composite is subdivided into the tests for fine manual control, manual coordination, body coordination, and strength and agility. They each are subdivided into two subtests, making eight subtests total, and each subtest is calculated by multiple items. So if you might imagine, <laughs> that's a lot of items. Um, so how long does it take to administer? And the manual will tell you, I, I think it's like 40 to 60 minutes uh, is appropriate for the entire complete form. I block off at least an hour. <laughs> Um, even an extensively trained clinician can face uh, a child with very troubling comprehension, cooperation, focus, and, and half of your battle is just getting the instructions relayed to the child. So <laughs> um, block off at least an hour. That, that would be my professional recommendation. Um, and then there is luckily a short form that you can utilize and that does typically only take about 15 minutes or so with a cooperative child. 
um, so significantly less time. Uh, but as a quick tip on composite subscales, it is worth noting that with the BOT2, you can administer and interpret uh, fine motor versus gross motor composites. So I made little notations here. Um, classically, OT categories of fine motor control would be fine manual control and manual coordination. And so OT might spearhead these while PT assesses these uh, for the gross motor. So we have body coordination and strength and agility. Um, so why I think that is quite important to recognize is uh, that if you and OT, let's assume you're a PT, if you and OT performed your evaluations on the same day or close to it, um, you might want to share findings to acquire that total motor composites, uh, uh, com sorry, composite and garner even more data collection. So you save a bunch of your time in the evaluation, they save a bunch of their time, um, and you're also a little more fine-tuned and focused on your corresponding uh, categories anyways. So um, if I were to describe scenarios or rationales for why I would choose one over the other, whether it's the short form versus the complete form in its entirety, or the complete form with just a singular composite, like fine or gross, um, I would say that for the short form, I use this when I want data on both fine and gross motor proficiency, but I'm really short on time and I just want a quick screening tool. OT is not on board. Short form is my go-to. Um, now, for the complete form in its entirety, I use this when I know I have plenty of time and I want maximal data for the ind individual's total motor proficiency. Uh, this will give me the best picture of that child's level of ability. Now for the complete form, but only using one of the motor composites, whether it's the two fine motor categories or the two gross motor categories, I will use this when I know the other profession, whether it's OT or PT, assesses the complementary composite. And then I will share my data with them following our evaluations to get the total motor composite. Um, now, you don't necessarily have to do that, but I highly recommend it for the best picture of what that child's level of ability are or is. Um, now, at this point, I do typically like to discuss psychometric properties and dive into reliability and validity, but I actually don't want to go into detail because there are several extensive charts like, for example, this, this first one, uh, table 6.2. Now, this one is just for standard errors of measurement. But if you are looking for other properties, there are other charts. It's far too extensive to go in depth verbally on a video. Uh, so definitely refer to that manual and look those up yourself. Um, now, let's see. As a rule of thumb, though, if I just had to congregate all the data and say general rule of thumb, the metrics are favorable for the bot too. And I know that given that information, I often see this outcome measure being compared to other norm referenced measures like the PDMS2 and the Movement ABC2. That's the second edition of the Movement ABC and second edition of the PDMS. Um, so a question I get a lot is, why would I use the bot two over those alternatives when they each assess fine and gross motor capabilities to some extent? And it's a really good question um, to break it down. If we first look at the PDMS-2, those children age out at six years. So if your child is older than six, you wouldn't be using the PDMS-2 anymore. If your child is between the ages of four and six, four being when you can start using the BOT-2, six being when you can no longer use the PDMS-2, um, so if your child is between four and six, comparing the two assessments becomes very, very applicable. The differences in the measures and what they assess, or sorry, assess 
would dictate your selection. So for example, the PDMS-2 assesses ball handling skills as part of its object manipulation section, um, whereas the BOT-2 doesn't so much do that, but it does assess strength and agility. So if you're more interested in ball handling, go with PDMS-2. More interested in just generic strength and agility, go with the BOT-2. Uh, if neither of those, it's toss-up, you don't really care, then you might want to consider whether or not norm referencing based on sex specifics is important to you. If so, if you want to know how this male of this age compares to the generic population of typically developing males of that same age, you probably want to side with the bot too. Um, if, let's say, sex specifics is not that big of a deal to you, um, then you want to consider what other conditions your child might have. For example, the PDMS-2 is much more geared towards children with CP, uh, cerebral palsy. Uh, at the same time, the BOT-2 is much more geared towards those with DCD and perhaps intellectual disabilities and autism, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but moving on to comparing the BOT-2 with the Movement ABC-2. Considering that prior information, the movement ABC picks up after the PDMS-2, and it can be used for individuals three years of age all the way through 16 years of age. And, and like the PDMS-2, it also assesses ball handling skills. So if that is an area of priority, you may want to side with the movement ABC-2. Um, but one crucial difference is that the movement ABC allows for practice attempts so if you're a clinician that finds this disagreeable despite the assessment's proven validity and reliability, I mean, I understand, um, but the, if that's the case and you're not okay with practice attempts, the, the movement ABC might not be the outcome measure for you. Uh, in that case, go ahead and use the bot too. Um, but moving on though, I would like to review uh, a few helpful tips for using the bot too before I draw to a close. And the first would be one of the most underutilized tools, and that would be optional scripts. These teaching texts are so helpful to a new clinician. Um, so for those that see the bot too, it can be very daunting with all of its subtests, the items, the toys and gadgets involved, but uh, this is Appendix D on page 257 of the manual. And if you don't have the manual in front of you, you can refer to your administration easel. And this thing has the same optional text and it is on page 119. So definitely utilize these. These can help reduce the stress um, in the amount of things that you have to coordinate by just giving you something to read off. It's very simple, very easy to use. The second tip, scoring guidelines and scoring examples. They are also part of the administration ESOL. And just to give one example, uh, this is fine motor integration. It gives you the scoring guidelines. Um, there are subtitles here and text descriptions. There's a pictorial representation down here of random children's drawings and then the scores associated with each of the drawings. I highly recommend that you do not just read the subtitles and assume you know what it means. Read through all of the text just in case and don't look at the picture and just out of curiosity see what the scores are. Actually cover up the scores, quiz yourself. And that is going to be huge for when the time comes that you actually do score this assessment. Um, I, I highly, highly recommend using this. Again, that's part of the administration easel. And hopefully with that, you have a greater understanding of the BOT2 and what it entails and a more solid foundation for administering the assessment. Uh, I will follow up with a video for scoring, converting, and interpreting the BOT2, and I will post it down in the description below. Uh, until then, I hope you all have a wonderful day.